Welcome to another episode of Preferred Walk On PFS College Football Show. I'm your host, Max Chalik, alongside again my co host, Dalton Wasserman. Took the week off last week, was in New Orleans celebrating Mardi Gras. Dalton, before we begin, man, how, how was New Orleans? How was uh, lovely Louisiana this past week? Oh, it's the best time of year to be there. Of course, it's it's a circus. Um, just just adventurous everywhere you go. That's the best way you can put it. But it's it's the funnest time on the planet, honestly. And then and then I had to follow it up the weekend after with uh, with two weddings in two days, oh. one over there and one in Florida. So it was a whole a whole week of just just wild adventures and flying around and doing everything. But uh, but definitely tell you what for last week's show, you guys, you know, you and Trevor, a great episode too. Uh, real grateful for him stepping in for me and. Uh, and yeah, no, just an adventure still in Florida here and kind of a temporary setup, which is always, I mean, you know, Florida has its reputation, so that's a whole nother circus, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, great times. And, and honestly, if you don't, I've, I've done Mardi Gras now three times and it's, it's the best time ever. If you get to do it, if you get to do it once, it's, it's the best experience you could have. Honestly, I think Eli and I need to come down to Mardi Gras next year and we do a live show from Mardi Gras next year. Like, that'd be, that's, that sounds oh, like a plan. <laughs> that, that would, that would be, I don't know if we're in the right, yeah. we'll be in the right frame of mind uh, or state or physical state to be able to do that. But that'll be a lot of fun. I, dude, first of all, uh, you have good friends for not having fall weddings. I have a fall wedding. I, I have to go to in October and I'm not looking forward to that. That's going to be brutal uh, during college football and NFL season, honestly. And I also, man, I noticed you're not wearing a lot of beads right now. So you weren't, uh, you know, you weren't flashing too well, many people at, at Mardi Gras uh, and earning your. You beads. know, I have them. They're stowed away somewhere, <laughs> somewhere else. I didn't even, I didn't even think about it because it's still just kind of like, still, it, it takes a while to decompress from it all. And the longer you keep them on, the longer you want to keep partying. So, um, you know, I figured, I figured, let me, let me for like an hour here and get back to at least looking professional and then we'll you know maybe maybe next time i'll find i'll find something also you know some of them you gotta find appropriate ones too because yeah. you know you never know you never know what gets thrown at you but <laughs> uh no you know what it's something i hadn't even thought about see that I'm, I'm never i'm never one see i'm not i'm not as like um what is it aesthetically like conscious as you are like i just mm. i just forget things like that you know i'm not one to like decorate and dress up and I'm like, darn it i always forget opportunities like that that's fair that's fair yeah I, honestly man so i'm excited man i'm excited to get into this episode with you so first of all we're gonna talk about uh the news that came out yesterday of the playoff committee discussing expanding the playoff even though we haven't even gotten to the 12 team playoff era yet uh and then also uh later on in the show which basically would be the entire episode we'll be going over daniel jeremiah's uh latest mock draft his second mock draft uh he's one of the best in the business and also his mock drafts hold a lot of weight because they are usually based off of intel that he's gotten from nfl teams so that's something that uh, we can look forward to as well but let's start off like i said before uh with this 14 team playoff and this is uh news this is major news that happened it seems like it's gaining momentum uh it was reported yesterday that during their meetings uh in dallas that they were talking about expanding to a 14 team playoff in starting in the 2026 season so we might only get two years of a 12 team playoff before even going bigger to 14 teams what do you th make of this man do you think this is a little too soon for this or uh or what do you think about this news for college football no i'm all for it i'm all for it, even if they said 16 to be honest with you i think any sort of playoff expansion honestly in any sport at this point that's what people want to see they want to see the postseason and also for me if it up if it opens opportunities more for home games home postseason games instead of instead of the neutral site i i think that might be the best part of what's coming this year with the 12 team is that first round when you get four home games for five through eight um I, i'm all for it i think the longer you keep teams relevant more and more teams relevant for the postseason chase the better the game is right I, I think i think we've seen it you know even in the nfl sometimes people are like well are you watering it down with too many wild cards no no it's still great i, I just think the longer you can have because there's too many times we've seen with a 14 playoff where we get to the last two three weeks of the season and we're really just talking about last year with three weeks to go we were talking about like nine teams mm -hmm. right I, I really think with a 12 team playoff with three weeks to go you could be talking about something like 30 teams I, exactly I mean, on, t on top of the group of five you know me you know me I, I like having the group of five involved whether it be conference champs or if they run the table and undefeated and all that I, I think the more teams you have involved later in the season, it's it's only better for the game. And 14, two more spots, I, I'm all for it. Yeah, I think that's something that people always forget about uh, when you talk about expansion, because I know the whole 
argument of, oh, you're going to water down the regular season, which is the best part of college football. But also, like you mentioned, I mean, there are going to be more teams that are involved now, which is going to make it more exciting. Now, of course, maybe the top end teams like Ohio State or Michigan or Georgia or whoever, maybe they will be, you know, pretty comfortable in the final couple of weeks. And maybe the Ohio State Michigan game won't be as massive in terms of playoff implications. But it, it'll still be uh, a lot more teams that are involved in this, which I, I think would be a good thing. I, I, I'm a little cautious, though, about this. I want to see how the 12 team works first before we even you know decide to move to 14 um but i i listen i think this is the way they're probably going to go because the big 10 and sec which are quickly becoming the two most prominent conferences in college football as if they weren't already but now they're even more so they uh i think the reason why they're going to go to 14 is that they want to get as many as four automatic bids uh from the big 10 and sec i think those two conferences instead of them splitting up and going uh elsewhere like there's been discussions of uh i think this is kind of a way to appease those two conferences and say okay listen we'll, we'll treat you guys like the you know, kings of college football that you are, and we'll give you guys more automatic bids than the other conferences in college football. I think that's the reason why. I don't think this is really anything to do with money. I think it has more to do with access uh, for, you know, the Big Ten and SEC uh, in it. So it's going to be interesting, and whether or not they decide to do this, and, and honestly, I don't know if they're going to be done at 14. They might even go to 16 later on, like you said before. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how they, they go about this. And, I mean, they, they already announced the 5-7 and seven model for the 12-team playoff, too, So um, which is going to be interesting as well. So, uh, yeah, a lot of, lot of moving parts in college football right now that we'll get into, obviously, later on down the stretch. But it is, Dalton, officially draft season. And, of course, we did our mock draft a couple weeks ago we had trevor on last week to talk about you know how generational are the top guys now we're going to go over a mock draft that's not our own but is the great daniel jeremiah's from nfl network that you can find at nfl.com so let's pull up that mock draft all right so i think the best way that we can go about this Dalton, instead of going over every single pick in this mock draft i think we go maybe five at a time here and talk about some notable picks uh in there and one thing to note too that daniel noted at the top of his article there are no trades in this mock draft he's not predicting any trades just yet uh so this is, this is the exact order that we have in the nfl draft right now so the first two picks uh bears taking caleb williams uh not too much of a surprise there commanders taking drake may the quarterback from north carolina again not too much of a surprise there uh you go down to the patriots they're passing on a quarterback and they're taking marvin harrison jr the ohio state receiver at number three which leaves the cardinals at number four taking malik neighbors the receiver from lsu and then the chargers at number five taking joe alt the offensive tackle from notre dame so out of those first five picks dawn what stands out to you uh, a couple of things i think we know either quarterbacks or receivers are going top four at this point and i think with the patriots the more i was thinking about them i don't think a quarterback if it was Jaden daniels or drake may or whoever would be a bad choice um you know something i look at with them though where harrison makes sense they need to get more explosive on offense at pretty much every position so if they're going to roll with Mac Jones for another year and pick up a Marvin Harrison, there's almost no way that Harrison couldn't make your offense better regardless of who's throwing to him. Uh, I'm not saying at all that Mac Jones is a long-term answer, but I, I get the reasoning behind taking a receiver three just because they, they need everything offensively. Honestly, the second half of the year last year, you could argue Zeke Elliott was their best player on offense, and that's really not a good situation all the way around. They need a total rebuild of their entire offense, and if they wanted to start it with Harrison, that would make sense. And then I think at five with the Chargers, this is really one of the most interesting slots in the draft yeah. because I think you could argue – offensive line like we have here with joe alt you could argue receiver if especially if malik neighbors were still on the board um you could argue I, we've been talking about brock bowers and just the way that jim harbaugh and greg roman have used tight ends in the past and how good brock bowers is we've seen bowers mocked as high as five and as low as you know 18 or i've even i think in one draft i saw maybe 20 um there's a lot of options here for the chargers the only thing i question with alt is that you already have Rashawn Slater in place at left tackle, but he mentions here you could play him at guard for a year or two. You could put him at right tackle. Joe Alt's so talented, you could probably put him anywhere and he would succeed. Uh, I think very much. I think Zach – didn't Zach Martin come out as a tackle also from Notre Dame and then moved into guard? Is that yeah, right? I believe so. Yeah, yeah so it, it could just be that talented where he could play any position. Um, but that – I think the Chargers really – the Bears at the top are obviously the story of the NFL right now, but I think the Chargers at five have a very – 
interesting set of things that they could do with that pick. Yeah, so he mentions it in that uh, Patriots you know, blurb right there that the Patriots go the veteran route to fill the need at quarterback, which means to me, I mean, there's guys like Kirk Cousins available in free agency. Justin Fields uh, is available via trade. Uh, Russell Wilson will probably be available as well. Um, I know Russell Wilson actually is betting odds. He's actually favored to go to the Steelers right now. Instead of returning to the Broncos, he's more likely to go to the Steelers, apparently, according to the betting odds. So there are guys available uh, out there that you can get um, for the Patriots, I, I'm wondering if they're going to get any of those guys, honestly. Um, but if they go that route, then yeah, Marvin Harrison Jr. makes a lot of sense here. Uh, and I get the argument that if you get a guy like Jaden Daniels or get a guy like Drake May, they're not in a good spot, man. That that Patriots organization is not in a good spot, especially offensively right now, that they're going to struggle out the gate and you could really you know, risk ruining their development. I still, if I don't get a veteran quarterback, I don't think I would take Marvin Harrison Jr. here. I'd probably go with uh, one of the top three quarterbacks, but I could at least understand the thinking uh, but, uh, behind that. And obviously, if Marvin Harrison Jr. goes at number three, Malik Nabors makes the most sense for for Cardinals at number four who desperately need to get another pass catcher for Kyler Murray. And I wanted, yeah, I wanted to talk about that Joe Alt pick number five because you mentioned it like Rashawn Slater is the starting left tackle he's one of the best left tackles in the league uh Joe Alt never played right tackle before but I think he would slot in there pretty well but I I just love the fit of Brock Bowers going to the Chargers and I think it's worthy of being the number five overall pick I think he's probably the second best pass catcher in the draft behind Marvin Harrison Jr. uh I personally would go with Brock Bowers there at number five um and I'm I'm surprised a guy like maybe like Roma Dunze would you consider him over someone like Joe Alt too or do you think that's would you rather have Joe Alt than Roma Dunze at number five for the Chargers I think I think they have a ton of options. I also think if Jaden Daniels is still on the board you at trade five, down. then yeah. that's a that's a prime prime trade down spot. Yeah. Whether it be to Atlanta or Vegas or Denver or somebody else who might be looking for for a Jaden Daniels type talent at quarterback, I, I think any if if Jaden Daniels is still on the board and the Chargers are sitting there at five, I I think they could go any which way imaginable about. It. I think it's a prime prime trade down spot because even you think about. If they trade down, say to eight to Atlanta, they could still find them. They could take Brock Bowers at eight. They yeah. could even maybe take Brock Bowers at I believe it's twelve or thirteen, where Vegas is picking. Denver and Vegas are right there back to back. I, I they could do anything they wanted, especially if Jaden Daniels is still on the board here. Yeah, that's a great point. I think Brock Bowers, if he doesn't go at number five overall, I don't think he's going to go very high honestly and we'll get to Brock Bowers because he does go a little lower in this mock draft we'll get to him in a second but yeah I think that's a good point that the Chargers can trade down if, if one of these top three quarterbacks is available and still get the guy that they would have taken in fifth overall uh, even later in the draft which is a pretty rare thing uh, the Chargers are kind of in a unique spot right there so uh, next five picks we're going to talk about six through ten the Giants taking Jaden Daniels he, the fall stops there for him at six uh, Olu Fashanu going to the Titans at seven JJ McCarthy going to the Falcons at eight we're Roma Dunze going to the Bears at 9, and then Talisa Fawaga going to the Jets at 10. So out of those five picks, Dalton, what sticks out to you? Uh, the obvious, the quarterbacks, the two quarterbacks. Um, I think, first of all, if the Giants are taking Daniels, obviously it's a change of direction for their entire franchise. They have really one more year where they have to stick out Daniel Jones's contract. Um, but, no, Jaden Daniels, if Brian Dable's really looking for that just supernova playmaker like he had with Josh Allen and Buffalo, I mean – that's that's really it's it might be a gamble and they still need weapons especially on the outside to make it work but yeah. but something about Jaden Daniels and Brian Dable and like I said everything they got that he accomplished in Buffalo um it, it makes I could see exactly why the Giants are trying would be trying to restart their Jones especially coming off an ACL and has never shown you to be like an explosive playmaker like that I, I think that's big time and then McCarthy to the Falcons uh, to me is probably the most interesting pick on this whole board um, you and I both aren't really sure if he's worthy of like top 10. There are, I've seen, you know, things from other scouts that say that they think he's the second best quarterback in this draft. Um, I, I just don't, we never saw him, you know, we've seen Caleb Williams carry an offense. We've seen Drake May carry an offense for two years. Jaden Daniels has done it. JJ McCarthy, was he a reason Michigan won the title? Yes. Was he the number one reason? I, I don't even think it's close no he wasn't the number one reason um i think i do think I, i've liked the idea that's been brought up of if the rams took him later in the first round and he sat behind stafford and yep. got in the mcveigh offense and learned that i do think with zach robinson 
joining the Falcons as their OC, you know, bringing over McVay's system. I think that is a system that actually works to McCarthy's strengths. I'm just not entirely sure if McCarthy's ready to roll day one, but there's plenty of talent in, in Atlanta to work with. And if it's a similar scheme, you know, you're talking about that offensive line and Bijan Robinson and Drake London and Kyle Pitts. There's, there's plenty there to work with. It could be, he could be in a much worse situation for sure, but it's, it's a, I think it's the gamble, and it's it's definitely, for me, the most interesting pick on this entire board in, in this mock draft. Yeah, I think, listen, I, I, I'm with you. I would take Jason McCarthy later. Uh, honestly, he probably he, he would be a second-round pick for me, at least, but he's going to go in the top 15. I mean, everything that we've seen now has, has been, you know, all the smoke has been Jason McCarthy going top 15, and he goes top 10 here. I don't even think top 10 is that ridiculous either uh, with the teams that need a quarterback. And listen, again, he's got all the tools, man. He's got all the tools. He, he, sh- he actually played really well this past season. It's just the problem is that he, again, wasn't relied on to do that much for Michigan's offense, which is why it scares me to take him top 15, top 10 when you're a team like the Falcons and you expect him to come in day one and be the quarterback. He, to me, if you're going to take him in the first round, he should have like the Patrick Mahomes, Jordan Love plan where it's, okay, sit for a year, and then hopefully you could take over after that. Or maybe even Jordan Love, sit for a few years, and then take over after that. That, to me, is the best plan for Jason McCarthy, but if you're spending a top 10 pick on him, like the Falcons, and you only have Desmond Ritter, it's not like you have a proven guy at quarterback, uh, you're probably going to start Jason McCarthy sooner rather than later. So that that's what scares me about Jason McCarthy. I'm not denying his talent. I'm not denying he can be a franchise quarterback. I'm just a little bit scared to put that much capital in him um, when we just haven't really seen too much yet. So uh, it makes sense in terms of the Falcons needing a quarterback, but I'm just, I don't know, man. I don't even know if I would take him over Penix or Knicks right now, honestly. Like, I, I still might take them over because I think they're more proven. Of course, they're older and have lower ceilings probably than McCarthy, but I, I think they're a little bit more proven, which is, I don't know, it's a little scary for me. Uh, the other one I want to talk about was Talisa Fawaga at number 10. So, do you think. Obviously, we talk about it all the time, how the Jets need to take a tackle and need to take a really good pass protector so that they keep Aaron Rodgers upright. As a Jets fan, Dalton, uh, with Fashanu and all off the board in this scenario, is it still tackle or bust? Do you still take Talisa Fuaga here, or maybe do you look elsewhere like a Brock Bowers or, or someone else to uh, fill that need? I think it's tackle or bust, but I think it gets harder. I, I think with both of those guys off the board, I, I wonder if this isn't a trade back a few spots kind of spot where you could trade back and still take a jc latham or an amarius mims um fuaga look i'm not going to sit here and say they'll go wrong if they take fuaga fuaga is a great player i just think there's better team fits i think i think on a team like jacksonville or or a cincinnati or a team you know uh, i think the raiders may have a need at right tackle also just makes a little more sense where the Jets so badly need pass protection. And maybe he'll maybe he'll bloom into a great pass protector. I could be wrong on this. I just it's more about the team fit than Fawaga to me. I, I think if this scenario were to play out for the Jets, you could be looking at trading back a few spots. Maybe there's a team that would trade up for a Bowers, or maybe there's mm-hmm. a quarterback needy team that wants to get ahead of Minnesota and Vegas and Denver. You maybe Pittsburgh surprises us all and trades up. I think I think it opens up a little more. I think if Alta Fashanu are on the board, have to take him. That's yeah. it's like not even a question. I, I think they start to question some things, and I still, I still wonder if Joe Douglas would think about a weapon here, even if he would think about Brock Bowers here, um, or if Odunze were still on the board instead of going there at nine. And let's say the Bears have been a lot of talk of him taking a pass rusher. I think they would think about Odunze at ten also. Um, but I, I think I think the priority kind of goes it's Alt or Fashanu. And then maybe if they're both gone, then we start looking at options. Yeah. I think, again, there's no trades in this mock draft. So that would be, I think it would be a prime trade down spot for the Jets, too. Because, again, I like Fuaga a lot, um, but he is a dominant run blocker who's a, you know, good, not great pass protector. And that's not what really what the Jets need right now. So um, I don't love the fit with Fuaga going to the Jets, but with Alt and Fashanu off the board. It somewhat makes sense. I do love J.C. Latham, and I think he's a way better pass protector than, than Talisa Fuaga, so I think he 
Could be an interesting spot here, but again, I don't know if I would take him at number 10. I might try to trade down and get him a little bit later. Uh, another guy who I think could really rise after next week, Dawn, which the NFL Combine, is Amarius Mims because he's a freak, freak athlete, man. I think he might wow a lot of people in Indianapolis, and I think he could move up and maybe even be a top 10 or 15 projected pick, honestly, in 2024 after the Combine uh, as well. So let's go over to 11 to 15 now. So the Vikings take Dallas Turner, the Al Alabama edge defender there at number 11 and actually i'm looking right now yeah that is the first um that will be the first uh defensive player off the board at number 11 which i believe is the record uh i believe in 2021 the first defensive player off the board was eighth overall and jc horn which i believe was the previous record uh 11 here would, would break that record so dallas turner no defensive players in the top 10 dallas turner breaks that there at number 11 another edge defender at number 12 going to the broncos and jared verse terry on arnold uh at 13 going to the raiders the alabama corner another alabama player at number 14 14 uh, in J.C. Latham, the offensive tackle we talked about before, to the Saints, and then Nate Wiggins, the Clemson corner, going to the Colts there at number 15. So 11 to 15, dominated by Alabama, with three Alabama players in those five picks. Uh, what stands out to you, Dalton, in those five picks, though? Um, those first three teams there, Minnesota, Denver, and Vegas, um, sitting there with quarterback situations very much in flux, right? You know, mm -hmm. Denver is going to cut Russell Wilson. Um, Minnesota, we kind of, there's an assumption that Kirk Cousins is coming back, but I, you know, if he, they don't want to give him a fully guaranteed contract and they, they do eventually here need to start looking long-term. Like I, that's a spot where I don't think Michael Penix would be a bad fit at all. And the Raiders, you know, are they really, look, their defense was one of the best down the stretch last season. They have Devontae Adams. They have, you know, you have a franchise left tackle and Colton Miller. You have Michael Mayer, you have Jacoby Myers. You have a ton of pieces, but are you actually going to walk in and try to compete with Mahomes and Herbert with Aiden O'Connell? Right? Yeah. I, I don't, I just, I, that doesn't seem feasible to me. Now, maybe they go after, maybe they're a team that goes after Justin Fields. I mean, I know Atlanta and Pittsburgh have been kind of the hot topics of conversation, but the Raiders are a team that I sit here and go, they need a quarterback. Yeah. They, they need something, whether it's Fields, Penix, trade up, like, and them taking a defensive player here, unless they go and get maybe Russell Wilson or, or Kirk Cousins, if he's actually free, I don't really know where else they would go if they take a defensive player. I, all of a sudden, now I'm just assuming they're building a defensive team with Aiden O'Connell at the helm, and that's not, you know, O'Connell serviceable. I do think he's a really good backup. But you can't you can't compete with Patrick no. Mahomes with Aiden O'Connell. Even if they were, as Antonio Pierce said this week, the last team to beat the Chiefs, the, I don't believe they completed a pass in the last three quarters of that game. You're not going to beat them every time like that. So I'm really curious with all three of these teams how, especially through free agency and possibly a Justin Fields trade, where the quarterback situations go here. Because I look at all three of them that all of a sudden could join that group that's in the top ten, or even you know be a trade up group. Like we talked about. I don't know if the Chargers would actually do it in division, but, you know, say the Chargers at five, or even the Giants at six, I think, are a good trade-down spot. Maybe the Raiders hop in, man. If Jaden Daniels is on the board, you have Jaden Daniels, Devontae Adams, Myers, um, Michael Mayer, figure out the running back situations, Amir White, That's that all of a sudden looks explosive, but they don't – I just don't think they can make the playoffs with Aiden O'Connell as a quarterback. No, man, I think those are the three teams that I'm looking at right now that – one of them is going to fall in love with J.J. McCarthy or at least be desperate to get J.J. McCarthy and might try to trade up to get him, honestly. Because you mentioned it. I mean, the Vikings might bring back Kirk Cousins, but even so, I think he's like 35 years old right now. Uh, Brad, Spielger, Brad Spielberger, our, our top you know, salary cap guy, who's, who's honestly the best in the business, he projects only like a two-year contract for Kirk Cousins. So it's not like your long-term answer is Kirk Cousins. He's probably just going to be another couple of years. Then uh, he's going to be 37 years old, honestly, at that point. So coming off a, a torn Achilles as well. So the Vikings are going to be thinking about moving on. The Broncos are already thinking about moving on with Russell Wilson most likely out of town. Uh, and the Raiders, like I mentioned, have a desperate need at corner, uh, desperate need at, uh, at uh, quarterback as well. I think that one of those three teams is going to go after J.J. McCarthy and, and try to get him. And, you know, that's why I think J.J. McCarthy's stock is rising so much. It's because those three teams there at 11, 12, and 13 are going to get desperate as well. So I think that's the really the biggest 
interesting thing to me is that you know those three teams pass on Bo Nix, pass on Michael Penix Jr. It sounds like J.J. McCarthy is kind of universally becoming QB4 for uh, the NFL draft, and Penix and Nix are kind of falling down boards a little bit, at least from mock drafts it looks like that. So it's a little interesting that, that these three teams go with defensive players when they all pretty clearly have a need at quarterback uh, as well. All right, let's go to 16 to 20 here. The Seahawks taking Byron Murphy, the Texas defensive tackle. Uh, the Jaguars going with Quinion Mitchell at 17, the Toledo corner. The Bengals, I know Eli's going to love this. Brock Bowers going to uh, the Bengals there at 18 overall, uh, the Georgia tight end. And then 19, the Rams taking Jackson Powers Johnson, the Oregon center. And then the 20, the Steelers taking Troy Fountainow, the Washington offensive tackle, who could also play a little bit on the interior offensive line, most likely will play on the interior offensive line uh, at the next level as well. So from 16 to 20, Dolan, what uh, stands out to you? I, I think there's just a lot of good fits here, right? Bowers to the Bengals sticks out. I know Eli would be jumping out of his shoes, but that that just feels like, especially if they were to keep T. Higgins, that, that feels like a perfect fit. It's kind of the one thing that Burroughs never had up there is just an elite tight end like that. Um, I think I think this Fatano move to the Steelers is big time. They need badly, badly, badly offensive line help, right? Broderick Jones, they moved him over to right tackle last year. Played decent, but they they have just for the last two years really been a mess on the offensive line. It's disjointed their whole offense, right? They The last two years, they've had pretty much the worst left tackle situation in football. Mm -hmm. He's a proven pass protector. They need it badly. It sure sounds like, from what we've heard this week, that they're just going to let Kenny Pickett and Mason Rudolph, if they re-sign him, fight it out for the starting job, as the, as opposed to making a big move. Obviously, smoke screens are what they are, but the Steelers are usually pretty honest about that stuff. And any which quarterback they have, they they just need to get better in the trenches, substantially better. Um, they you know they talk about you have Najee Harris, you have Jalen Warren, you want to run the ball, you want to do all these things. You know, even fans get on about not throwing down the field. But if you have no pass protection, it really doesn't matter. I think it's a very similar thing that we're talking about um, with the Jets, where if you can't pass protect, it just doesn't matter. The Steelers, this would be, I think, a great pick for the Steelers. We've, we've mocked Powers Johnson to them. If they don't get him and this scenario happens, I think this is also a great pick in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I want to get Eli. Eli, what are your thoughts here on, uh, on Brock Bowers going to 18? Would you be jumping for joy? Yeah, I'd be pretty excited. I feel I'm I'm in the same boat though. I don't think it's gonna happen. But yeah, I would love it. Um, to me, it really hurts seeing Murphy go right before this. I think he's a, a realistic fit here. But I'm I am a big Johnny Newton guy. So dude, I'd never be upset with that. If if you weren't a Johnny Newton guy, I, I don't think anyone on this show cannot be a Johnny Newton guy. He's like our he's our boy, and that's why I'm a little I'm a little devastated here. That he's not the first D tackle off the board. Uh, at 16, but it does sound like, and I know Trevor actually updated his big board recently, and he has Byron Murphy as the number one D tackle on his big board, and I think a lot of other people are going with that too. He's a terrific pass rusher, really awesome tools, a little undersized like Johnny Newton, but uh, he's kind of a freak athlete, man. Where, where Johnny um, has just been a really developed pass rusher with great pass rushing moves. A lot kind of reminds me a lot of like the Liatu Latu, but for defensive tackles, where like the tools aren't that crazy, but man, he's just so developed. He's going to enter the NFL and immediately be a really good pass rusher. But Byron Murphy seems to be like the DT1 for most people now. He's not my DT1, Johnny. I am still have you, man, but uh, he seems to be the guy for most people. And then Brock Bowers met at 18. That is like the home run pick of this draft and maybe one of the best home run picks I've seen in, in past drafts too, man. Because, I mean, you mentioned you get T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, and Brock Bowers. Like, that is not fair. And Tyler Boyd is still there too. That's not fair, man. So, the Cincinnati Bengals with that, I mean, would be phenomenal. And, and Joe Burrow's never had a, a, you know, superstar tight end, even dating back to LSU, didn't really have that. He had Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase, which is enough. Uh, and Terrace Marshall too, but he didn't have a superstar tight end there either. So, getting Brock Bowers, man, will be unbelievable unbelievable so that would be a great pick um and then let's move on to 21 to 25 now so at number 21 is 
The Miami Dolphins taking Latu Latu, we just mentioned the edge from UCLA. Ennis Rakestraw Jr., the corner from Missouri, going to the Eagles there at 22. Texans taking Brian Thomas Jr., the the wide receiver, excuse me, uh, from LSU. And then Cowboys taking Tyler Guyton, the Oklahoma offensive tackle at 24. And then at 25, Cooper DeGene, another friend of the show, going to the Packers, the Iowa corner. So from 21 to 25, Dolan, what stands out to you there? Um couple of them, I think, I think the Texans pick is a fun theory because they really need offensive line and help in secondary a little bit more. But to stack this up with Stroud would be, I mean, you let Tank Dell get in the slot full-time, That's that would make them really, really explosive. And I think I think I want to kind of disprove something with DeJean here for a minute because it's some things, some things I've been hearing, oh, he can move around, you can put him at safety. You know, in his career, he's played safety for three snaps at <laughs> Iowa. Yeah. And I think in the slot, maybe like 120 snaps in his first year starting. Like, Cooper DeGene is a corner, man. Like, an yeah. outside corner. I get, I get like, the idea of trying to move him around. He's a great athlete. But I, I really like it as a fit just opposite Jair Alexander. Just send him out there. Now, I think the big mystery is what kind of defense Jeff Halfley is going to run there. And DeGene's been kind of more of a zone corner at Iowa. But I really think, like... This idea that he like might not be an outside corner. No, that's he hasn't really he hasn't really been anything else at Iowa and he's proven he can play it at an elite level. Like I, I have seen I've seen some people say some mocks, some scouts, some things that were like, Oh, move him to safety. I'm like, he's never played safety. Like what is the where where is this coming I, yeah. from that, that he's not like he's one of the elite corners in this draft and for me I would just leave him out there. Honestly, and I like the fit for the Packers. I think they do need a number two corner opposite Alexander, but I'm not really getting the part where it's like, oh, just plug him in all over the place because we know he can do it. Where is where is that on tape? It's exactly. like I'm, it's I'm like when uh, it's like when the idiots say like a really good black quarterback should move to receiver or running back, and it's like like what are we talking about here? It's like that's the DeGene thing where it's like they can't really. You function like they can't make their brain understand that it's a really good white corner, and they're just like, "Oh, we got to move him to safety." Honestly, he's he's as technically sound, I, probably actually the most the most technically sound corner in this draft. And the, the one thing I would say is like, I, I think I've told you, for me, it's more of a system thing where like I wouldn't put him in a place like Minnesota because they didn't run a ton of man to man at Iowa. Like it might not be his thing, but I think a big thing for me, I think for as much as we talk about sometimes systems for quarterbacks or systems for receivers or this and that they're gonna be systems for like defensive backs too if he's a zone corner that's great i don't see any reason for that you know i think a a team like even a houston at 23 i would absolutely think about him the way that D'Amico ryan's runs that system or san francisco if he were to ever fall that far or i don't even hate like it's hard to tell again with jeff halfley being there it's new i don't know what they're going to run in green bay next year but i i just think the idea that he's like that he's like, oh, he should move back to safety, or like, we don't have any proof of that. Like, he could, he could go back there and be the worst safety in football. I don't know. We just don't. He played three snaps at safety in yeah. his career at Iowa. He, but, he's an outside corner, and to be honest with you, probably the most fundamentally sound outside corner in this draft. I would I would leave him out there and let it run, but I think it would be a great pick for Green Bay. I, it would be it would be a home run pick. I, honestly, I, I would love if uh, the Packers grab him because I mean he should not fall this far, man. I mean he's probably. I think right now he's still a top 10 prospect for Trevor Sycamore. I probably have him in that range, top 10, top 15. He's probably going to go top 20. But, yeah, 25, man, is low for Cooper DeGene. And not only is he technically sound, I mean, he's a freak, freak athlete, too. Like, he's a really, really good athlete. Um, so, you can make an argument he is the number one corner in this year's draft, which Trevor will. Um, so, yeah, the Packers that are getting him at 25 is uh, – is really really good, and I agree. He, he deserves a shot at outside corner. You know, I don't, I don't really care what people think about him. Like he does, he, he has shown in three years that he's been a really good outside corner for Iowa, and deserves a shot out there for sure. The other one I wanted to shout out, uh, just because I love the idea of this, is Latu Latu going to the Dolphins at 21. First of all, I think that's a another steal. I think Latu should go a lot higher than that. I understand the medical concerns. I understand he's not a freak athlete, um, and I understand his length isn't really what you love at the edge position. But he was our number two player in college football this past season. Broke the record for the highest graded season we've ever seen by a Power 5 player at 96.3. The reason why I love it here at 21 of the Dolphins is because you get basically two guys with basically the same exact background 
at Edge Defender Miami with Jalen Phillips and Laiatu Latu, where Phillips was at uh, UCLA originally, medically retired after a series of injuries, was actually the number one recruit coming out of high school, uh, medically retired, transfers to Miami, blows up at Miami, ends up being a first-round pick because of it. Uh, Laiatu Latu starts off at Washington, medically retires due to a neck injury, transfers to UCLA, blows up there, and ends up being a first, most likely a first-round pick because of it. So two guys, both connections to UCLA, where uh, Phillips transferred from UCLA, lot to transfer to UCLA. Um, I, I bet UCLA kind of saw that, and they saw how much they messed up by uh, losing Jalen Phillips to medical retirement and making him transfer whether, okay, we got to bring this guy in and see if this guy can actually work out and not make the same mistake twice. But I think I just think it's cool. And honestly, they, they remind me a lot of, uh, I think they both were 15. They both remind me a lot of, of each other with the way they rush the passer as well. Uh, I, I kind of love the fit there with uh, to Lotter, maybe just for the vibes of it, of him and uh, Jalen Phillips uh, kind of rushing off the edge together too. Yeah, I get that completely. I mean, and I think, and I think a big thing for Miami that so many injuries on defense this year with Chubb and with Phillips that they yeah. they really might need a guy like Latu, especially early in the year as 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 Phillips and Chubb recover from from their injuries i believe did phillips did he tear his achilles or was it an acl i think it was his, yeah i think it was might have been a, it might have been an acl actually i mean look it up real quick yeah, I, yeah i mean honestly in this scenario latu might walk in as a week one starter because of the injuries to the other guys yeah achilles it was an achilles yeah so yeah, yeah he might actually and chubb, i know chubb is there too but chubb has not chubb is really kind of disappointed since they traded for him uh as well but all right let's finish it out actually so instead of doing the first the last five picks we'll do uh last what seven <clears> or so <throat> picks so ad mitchell adonai mitchell the receiver from texas going to the buccaneers there at 26 darius robinson the edge from missouri really been rocking up draft boards going to the cardinals at 27 chop robinson going to the bills there at 28 the penn state edge zach frazier going to the lions at 29 the West Virginia center. Amarius Mims going to the Ravens there at 30. The Georgia offensive tackle. Uh, Graham Barton, the Duke offensive lineman. Really could play him at tackle, guard, center, wherever. Uh, going to the 49ers there at 31. And then Troy Franklin rounding out the first round to the Chiefs. The Oregon receiver there at 32. So out of those final seven or so picks, Dolan, what stands out to you? Uh, the last two for the for the two Super Bowl teams stand out. I think Graham Barton to the 49ers. The Niners, um, I, I think a story that's not being said enough, they need help in the trenches. They really mm. do on both sides of the ball. Pretty much their offensive line is Trent Williams and then everybody else. Yep. Uh, their D-line their D-line is very thin. Um, this, you know, here they go up front. I believe Brock Purdy was pressured on 48% of his dropbacks in the Super Bowl. Um, it, it was just not just not good enough uh, to win the game, right? When they ran off to the left side, it was a whole lot better than the right side. Barton, you know, is a guy that's thought to have some versatility. If You know, he's probably not going to be the best offensive lineman in this draft, right? But... You know he can play. He can play guard. I believe he even has reps at center if they really needed that. His first year, yeah, right he tackle. played there. Yeah, anywhere that they need him to play, I think the Niners. I think that's a good pick for them to take and kind of trial and error with it. It's an easy system to learn because it's really a lot of the same foundational things up front, especially in the run game with a whole lot of window dressing behind it, um, which is why they've had success with lower drafted offensive linemen. But they do need some talent and some versatility up there, and I think Barton would give them some flexibility to find just, okay, where does he fit in? And let's just get a solid starter in here to really start improving this thing. Cause Trent Williams isn't getting any younger either. They really need to figure this out now before he goes. And then as far as the chiefs go on this, that's a home run, man. To me, I, Troy Franklin mm -hmm. down there in Kansas city, Troy Franklin, Rasheed Rice. I mean, there's been, you know, outsides kind of some rumors about if they can clear enough cap room and depending what happens, maybe they're a team that goes after a Mike Evans, yeah. like, you start, I mean, again, and look, Patrick Mahomes has won his last two Super Bowls with kind of a shoddy-ish re receiving core. I love Rasheed Rice. I, I think, I'll tell you what, he might he might be a top 10 to 15 receiver next year. Yeah. Get him get him some polish and a little more muscle on him. He's, you know, he's really one of the more efficient receivers in football. But if you get a guy like Troy Franklin in there too, size, speed, runs, you know, just knows how to get open. You know, he was spectacular over there at Oregon. Somehow, you know, the way he runs, I forget that he's 6'3". I mean, just – I this could not be – I think there's several guys we would like here. I think Franklin or Lad McConkey from Georgia, I think would both be excellent fits in Kansas City. But I, I think if Franklin falls this far, that's a home run.
Yeah, honestly. So yeah, those are the two picks I wanted to talk about too. But yeah, you, you hit on them pretty well. So I'll, I'll go elsewhere here. Uh, one guy who I think is just rocketing up, and I'm curious to see, hear your thoughts, Dalton, is Darius Robinson, who honestly was a really good player for Missouri this past season. It's not like he wasn't. Uh, but all of a sudden now, man, he had a great week at the Senior Bowl. Really explosive player who I uh, really could have a great week at the Combine too. Uh, do you see this guy even moving higher than this? Like I, I've heard some people say after the Combine's over, he could move into the top 15, top 20 or so. Um, this is kind of, I, I mean, I like Darius Robinson. I, I just don't know if I would go that high. I, I, he seems to me like more of a second round player here. Uh, what do you think about him going in the first round or even higher than this in the first round? Um, you're, it's, it's look, every year in the first round, is a, there's probably three or four guys that get drafted on ceiling more so than production, and this is one of them. I, I think one thing, I, I have to go back and see more of the Missouri, and we watched a lot of Missouri tape this year, but the one theme it felt like for me with Missouri is they were always scheming pass rushers yeah. open. I'm, I'm curious to see in, in one-on-one situations digging in on Robinson's tape, and obviously he had a great senior bowl. If he goes out to the combine and shreds it, you're going to have another conversation, but I think especially though on the defensive line, you know, we've we've had studies done on this where that might be the position where it matters the most, the combine, just pure athleticism, because you can make it work. You can just it's just one on one matchups. It's not a whole lot of like scheming and everything and, and, and mental errors. It's just let's just go. Right. I think we've seen guys like this. I can think all the way back to even say a Jason Pierre Paul, who really only had one big year at USF, but tore up the combine, had all the measurables, and became a Pro Bowl-level player. Robinson could be that guy, and he's trendy right now. We get to this part of the year, and there's always a handful of guys who are trendy. Man, I mean, we're going to see a couple of 40 times, and all of a sudden, guys move up three rounds. Um, I like that he's versatile. You have to like the tools. Um, I, maybe the Cardinals are a team with two first-round picks here that can take a chance on a guy like that. They just need, I, I think, one theme that I was coming up with for them is they just need, no matter who it is and almost any position, just dynamic talent. Yeah. Right. And if they feel like Robinson is like, wow, this guy's like really dynamic. He can line up in different spots. He, he might be our best defensive player right now. You know, that, that might be, that might be a thing. I think, I think it's a similar rise that we saw last year from Tyree Wilson, right. Going to the Raiders. Now first year that didn't work out so great. You know, the, the hard part more so than taking the guy with the ceiling is developing him into hitting that ceiling. If, right. if Jonathan Gannon feels like he can do that, it's probably the right pick. But you have to be really, really sure that you have a plan for guys like that because otherwise it, that could also turn into the biggest bust of the first round. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing I want to shout out, Chop Robinson going there at 28. Uh, we actually have him lower on the PFF big board uh, with Trevor. And I love Trevor. I think Trevor is one of the best, if not the best, draft analyst out there. That's one I kind of disagree with him, though. I, I think Chop is still a first-round player. Man, I love the tools he's had. Um, he has unbelievable tools. And, yeah, the, the raw sack numbers and pressure numbers. He's, he's, been, he's been hurt over a little bit over the last couple of years. But, man, the pass rush win rate has always been phenomenal. Pre, the pass rushing grade has always been phenomenal. He's a guy I, I still think deserves to be a first-round player. So I, I love Chop Robinson still sticking in the first round there. Um, I wanted to shout out a couple guys who didn't make the first round of this mock draft, uh, Dalton. And two guys that really stood out to me were – um, Drazon Newton, the Illinois D tackle we talked about already, he falls out of the first round here. And Cooley McKinstry falls out of the first round in this Daniel Jeremiah mock draft. And one spot that I really thought either of them could have gone is the Detroit Lions at 29, who could use, really could use a corner. That's probably their biggest need right now. And then also they could use help on the interior defensive line. Instead, they take Zach Frazier there, uh, the West Virginia interior offensive lineman. And yeah, I understand how both their guards are going to schedule to hit free agency, but Frazier uh, is a center. They already have Frank Rag now, who's one of the best centers in the league right now. Um, that that kind of, I, I don't know if I love that pick. I think I might have gone with Cooley at 29 overall, um, if not take Jerzon Noon. But you know, there were there were a few guys on the, in this mock draft that that fell out of the first round. That I, I was kind of surprised by. And the two biggest ones, like I said, were Newton and McKinstry. I, I think Newton would easily go in the next six or seven picks of the second round. I, I, I don't think it would take very long for him to find a home. McKinstry is interesting because at one point for and you know, for really most of the year he was a top corner considered in this draft, and he's yeah. lights out, man. He just wasn't. He wasn't targeted a whole lot. I mean, teams were targeting Terry on Arnold, and Arnold was just beating them too. I mean, we really we were kind of of the opinion by the end of the year that that was the best secondary in college football. So, McKinstry's lights out. I, I, you know, if I'm the Lions, I'm looking at this entire offseason just going, how do I fix the back seven of my defense? Yeah, because you know, for as much as 
Dan Campbell and, and all the fourth down decisions and all of that is all oh, that's what blew. Look, you were up twenty four to seven. Their defense is just right this minute not good enough to make or win a Super Bowl. Just not. You were still up twenty four to seven, right? They just and they tried to band aid it last year. You know, Brian Branch, great player, like slot corner, strong safety, foundational player. But they they cool it. if McKinstry is on the board here for Detroit, I'm running to the podium. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't I don't yeah. think it's any question. Like number one type talent at corner. They run a ton of man coverage, which, you know, he McKinstry, that's really kind of what he does. He's like long, lanky press man corner. Like I I don't I don't really get this. I get adding, you know, sometimes you just add the best football players, right? Or, you know, regardless of position. But to me, if I'm the Lions, I'm approaching this entire offseason trying to get better. They were thirtieth in coverage grade this year. It's just not you can't even if they had made the Super Bowl, what what was gonna be their answer on the back end? Really, I I just don't. I don't understand. I don't understand how that could not be their number one priority. Their offense is good enough to go to and maybe win a Super Bowl. They have to have to find a way to cover. My hot take, which has become more of a hot take, which I can't believe has become a hot take, is that Cooley McKinstry and Cooper DeGean are almost one A one B for me in corners. I I, I think those two. I understand McKinstry's got some athletic concerns, and we'll see what he runs at the combine. But man, he has been locked down for Alabama for two years, and honestly is the biggest reason why Terry on Arnold is where he is right now because they didn't even look to number one side of the field. They always targeted Terry on Arnold, and Terry on Arnold, to his credit, really showed up this past season, but that would not have, would not have happened if Kool-Aid McKinstry was just ignored the way he was at Alabama this past year. So I, I think Kool-Aid is still... He's really being slept on in, in the first round of a lot of mock drafts right now. He doesn't get in the first round here. Uh, that is, it, it, like, I agree with you, man. If the Lions there at 29, he's still on the board. That is a guy I'm, I am sprinting to the podium for and making that selection uh, as well. But great mock draft from Daniel Jeremiah. Again, one of the best in the business uh, at, at doing this. So, yeah, man, uh, check it out at NFL.com. Check out the entire mock draft and check out all their stuff uh, later on. But, yeah, Dawn, so our sh- next show will actually be in Indianapolis, Dalton, Eli, and I will all be in Indy from Monday to Friday of next week. So if you're going to be at the NFL Combine, make sure to come over and say hi. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm excited to get to the Combine with you and then maybe talk to some players, talk to some coaches, and uh, just be talk around a lot of people, man. I mean, it was, it, be, you know, the NFL Combine last year was such an amazing week, also one of the longest weeks of your life, too. Uh, but I'm excited, man, to uh, tear it up in Indy with you, dude. I'm excited for this whole draft season. That's going to be that's the combine's going to be a blast. I, I think this is. I'm going to be honest. I, I've told you this before. I think this may be the most electric draft that I can remember. Just just the number of premier talents at premier positions. I I, I don't know. I don't remember a draft that that's been this stacked. At, I mean, it's it's maybe the flashiest draft I can remember. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I want to see. I don't know about you. I hope he's going to run. I hope. J, I, I hope we get to see Jaden Daniels run a four three man. I would love oh, to dude. see. It. Yeah. I, I think it's entirely. I think it's entirely possible. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm just waiting. You always go to the combine to see some of these freaks, man. And some of them are quarterbacks. Some of them are even offensive linemen. It, it's going to be a blast. It really is. Did you hear the uh, count this morning? Michael Penix Jr. is going to be throwing at the combine, too. Your guy. Oh, that's fantastic. So we're going to watch Love Michael it. Penix Jr. live, throwing throwing some balls deep, man. I'm, I'm excited for that. But, uh, yeah, so, of course, if you're going to be in Indianapolis, please come over and say hi to us. We'd love to chat with you. Uh, and, yeah, we'll see you guys next week live from Indianapolis. So for Eli, producer Eli, for Dalton Wasserman, I'm Max Chadwick. We'll see you guys next time.